So hello and welcome to today's seminar. I'm Beth Mischewski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center and seminar co-organizer. Today's seminar is the last one in our Spring 2019 series. Watch for more information on the fall series in late summer. A few housekeeping items before we get started. I'd like to remind our audience members here to please silence electronic devices as we are recording today's seminar. We will also hold all um, questions until the end, at which time I'll bring around this microphone so that those online can hear your questions. For those online, you can type in your questions at any time in the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we'll answer those at the end as well. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Corey Rusnick. Corey is a scientist at Michigan State University Fraunhofer Center for Coatings and Diamond Technologies. He earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry at Case Western Reserve University and his PhD in electroanalytical chemistry at the University of Cincinnati. Some projects that he's conducted at the center include PFAS remediation in wastewater, wearable sensors for uh, measurements of lead in sweat, and neurotransmitter detection uh, with diamond microfibers. The Fraunhofer Center is a nonprofit R&D organization that bridges the research gap between academia and industry. Please join me in welcoming Corey. Thank you, Beth, and uh, thanks for the invitation and hosting me today. I've really enjoyed it so far. I think we have some nice uh, synergies. We might be able to find some uh, future collaboration on a few different fronts. Um, but with that being said, um, I'm going to speak today about our uh, PFAS remediation project and some of the activities that we have going on. Um, this will be a little bit more of a survey of competing technologies and where uh, we believe um, electrochemical oxidation with BDD electrodes fits in this field. Um, and then I'm going to show some data and some other things that we're working on um, that are sort of uh, in concurrent to the research we're doing here. Um, so before I get into that, I just kind of want to give a brief background about the, uh, the, the MSU Fraunhofer Center and the dynamic of, uh, of Fraunhofer, whether that's in Germany or in the U.S. Uh, in general. So. Um, this is uh, Germany. Each one of these is a different location where there is a Fraunhofer Institute. So there's 67 institutes in Germany. There's a few in other uh, countries around Europe. There's some in the UK, Australia, and what have you. Um, this says 23,000 staff, but there's actually 25,000 staff now. Uh, and Fraunhofer, this Fraunhofer Society in Germany, or the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, touts themselves as the largest applied R&D organization in Europe. Um, each research institute has its own specific uh, purpose, similar to our model here, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but here's a number of different applications um, uh, of, of, of various institutes of, of what they work on. So it's a very widespread um, uh, research focus amongst all these different um, institutes. So this kind of elaborates that on a little bit more. Here kind of shows where a lot of institutes are located around the world. And then here we have the Fraunhofer USA, which is um, uh, made up of about six or seven research centers, as I'll show here. So most of which are on the campus of a university. Uh, we have one in the University of Connecticut, University of Delaware, uh, Boston University. And then we're located in East Lansing on the campus of Michigan State University, and we're the Center for Coatings and Diamond Technologies. So Fraunhofer USA, like I said, has a similar model to the uh, structure in Germany, where each of the centers has their own specific research purpose. Um, but the, the primary goal is to bridge the gap between industry and academic research. Uh, like I said, Fraunhofer is a nonprofit organization, so they're not commercializing technology, rather being the vehicle that takes something from the bench top into um, an industry where it can then be commercialized. And really, we do a variety of different things, whether that's industry projects, government projects, offer goods and services, and things like that. Um, as you'll see, our headquarters is also located in Plymouth, Michigan. They're not affiliated with a, um, a university. So not all of the uh, centers are associated with the university. but I would say that our relationship with MSU, with our center, is probably the closest knit of all the centers that work with the uh, university. Um, to kind of elaborate that uh, a little bit more, I think this is a little bit hard to see on the right. Um, but essentially, the model is, 
at, at the MSU Fraunhofer Center, we have about 18 full-time Fraunhofer USA staff, uh, primarily which are, are German nationals. And then we have about eight to 10 uh, faculty at Michigan State that are directly integrated into the center. Um, and then each of them have a research group of PhD students, undergraduate students, what have you. And it'll, sometimes projects are led by MSU and then there's a subcontract to Fraunhofer or vice versa. But really we have Fraunhofer staff working with um, basically PhD students, undergraduate students and faculty. So it kind of helps, uh, like I said, bridging this gap between academic and industry research helps the students get an understanding of what they're doing and how they could actually apply it but at the same time keep it fundamental and basic enough that they're executing research that is you know, thesis caliber, let's say. Um, our, our primary technology fields are in diamond technologies and coding technologies, kind of gives it away in the name of the center. Um, but since 2016 and 2017, we've added these systems and devices groups, 3D printing, so systems and devices, we're actually building uh, microwave-assisted chemical vapor deposition reactors. Uh, we want to become uh, the national diamond fab in the future. So uh, a core expertise will be in the uh, development of new systems and improving on our current reactor design and such things like that. And then we also, since uh, 2017, we actually have a 3D printing group that focuses on um, uh, printing metals for engine components, things like that. Um, let me go skip to the next slide. So these are really our core competencies. Um, we have two primary groups, really, that are one focusing on physical vapor deposition and another focusing on chemical vapor deposition. So our physical vapor deposition group has a lot of our industry customers. This technology is a little bit more mature than a lot of our CVD technologies, which are still more funded by a uh, little bit more hardcore R&D, whether that's for industry or for government. But the PVD group, this over here on the right is just, uh, these are end mills. This is a very, very common thing in our lab. We have a number of companies that send us cutting tools, end mills, all these things to deposit uh, our diamond-like carbon coating on them to improve corrosion and wear resistance. Uh, they have other projects where they've done anti-reflective windows um, uh, and a number of other things. Um, the other group primarily in, focuses on chemical vapor deposition. So I'll show uh, in the next couple slides um, what one of these groups does. Um, and that's in the fabrication and development of single crystal diamond plates and electrodes and things, diodes, transistors for high power, high temperature electronics. And then you split off into uh, polycrystal and diamond growth. And this is where we get into this electrochemical engineering and analysis, where we use these electrodes for wastewater treatment. We develop sensors, things like that. This image on the bottom right here shows a silicon wafer that we that we deposited diamond on and then structured all these individual little sensors. And this is something that we very commonly do and because uh, there's some pretty robust um, capabilities with respect to microfabrication, especially microfabrication of, uh, of diamond. Um, so here is one of the interesting single crystal diamonds. Like I said, this is, uh, if you ask my colleagues if we're growing diamonds for gemstones, it makes their blood boil. But that is actually one of our largest competitors was recently bought by De Beers. So they're going to switch to doing uh, laboratory grown diamonds. And that's actually, you can grow them with higher purity than what you can get out of the earth. So that's worth considering. Um, but nonetheless, we've had a few one-off type projects from like the MSU Foundation. They wanted the Sparty Head diamonds. So you can add different uh, process gases when you grow diamond or impurities to change the color. And while we use boron dope diamond, I'm going to show for the rest of this presentation, uh, when you grow single crystal boron dope diamond, it's blue. When you don't add any pure, uh, a boron or another impurity into single crystal diamond, it's clear. Sometimes it's yellow from the nitrogen content. Um, but in general, this was a, a single crystal diamond layer that was grown with no dope in their impurity. And then we sort of structured a layer on top and then deposited boron dope diamond and deposited a little sparty head on top of there. Uh, and then actually this one is a little bit different where we actually irradiated um, uh, the S to make it green inside the, the single crystal diamond. So this has been some interesting stuff. I don't work on these things, but I just wanted to show we do some pretty wild things with, with diamond. Uh, it might not be as exciting here as it is at MSU since uh, it's a competitor, I suppose. But this could be an I. It could be. Um, anyway, so now we can get into a little bit more of the details here. Uh, I want to go 
relatively briefly through what are PFAS, where do they come from, some of the transport exposure pathways, health effects. That's not really a part that we're really um, involved in, but I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Like I said, I'm going to talk about uh, other remediation technologies, some advantages, some pitfalls, things like that, and then really spend a lot of time on electrochemical oxidation and the, and the analytical challenges associated with this problem. Um, so again, a lot of my slides are deal with what's going on in Michigan, um, so I can kind of give you guys a little bit more of a background on what's going on there. But nonetheless, the folks out in Parchment, which is in, near Kalamazoo, haven't been able to drink their water for quite some time. This is in September 6th, so since last fall, they haven't been able to drink the water due to high PFAS concentrations. Uh, here's another thing about Michigan's next water crisis. There's them finding it in New York and landfill sites. Uh, huge issues around Air Force airports and Air Force bases like I'll talk about. Here's contamination in El Paso County, Colorado. And then here at the end of September, uh, there was a Senate subcommittee, and this is actually led by Senator Gary Peters, who is our district senator uh, in, in uh, mid-Michigan, and he um, is really leading the charge at the federal level on raising PFAS awareness, and he's doing a lot of uh, great things, and we've interfaced with his team quite a bit in the last couple of months. Um, so what are PFAS? You know, they're man-made chemicals that were used for a whole slew of advantageous things. Uh, one of my colleagues who's a professor at MSU told me this interesting story in the 70s when he purchased a Gore-Tex jacket because it was just the greatest thing on earth and he wore it for decades and now here you come to find out that for the reason, I mean, Gore-Tex is great because it's water repellent, but you know, there's perfluorinated chemicals associated with Gore-Tex. So there's always these advantages and disadvantages. But primarily we've got non-stick coatings, water stain resistant coatings, firefighting foams, vapor spreads. I'm going to get into this stuff a little bit more in detail. Um, but I, I really just want to use this slide to mention this here. So the challenge, I don't want additional challenge with PFAS when giving presentations and talking with people is that the nomenclature can sort of be ambiguous. And I, I commonly find people calling PFAS PFAS, which is fine, but at the same time, PFAS is an actual PFAS. So that's what can kind of make this a little confusing. So we have the perfluorocarboxylates, which is here, PFOA, you have this carbon fluorine chain here, and you have a carboxylic acid uh, at the end, and then the perfluorosulfonates, which is sort of similar, except we have a sulfonic acid group, and then these are referred to as the perfluoroalkyl acids. So all of these are PFAS. I'm going to talk about precursor compounds, but I'm going to commonly say perfluoroalkyl acids or perfluorocarboxylates, things like that. So I just wanted to kind of set everybody uh, straight. The nomenclature, at least, that I'm going to use in this presentation. Um, so what makes these things so strong? Well, fluorine's the most elect electronegative atom on the periodic table, so it loves its electrons. Carbon is sort of electronegative in its own right. So when you have this carbon-fluorine bond, it forms these partial charges. And when you get formation of partial charges, that's when the bond shrinks and then becomes stronger, which makes it more resistant to oxidation, things like that. Um, now, right here, we have perfluorobutanoic acid, so one of the perfluorocarboxylates. And the reason that I want to just show this is, and I know that some people call it the hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tail, but I'm going to, for this presentation, we're going to go with hydrophobic head and hydrophilic tail. So what I mean here is the hydrophobic head, this bulky carbon fluorine, and then the hydrophilic tail is the acid group. And I just want to keep this in mind for some of the adsorptive based technologies that I'm going to talk about. Um, I sort of went over this already um, about what they were good for, but as you can see, you know, this waterproofing of shoes and boots. I'll talk about how that has now led to, uh, that's basically a landfill that we're working with, um, have a lot of waste from the waterproofing industry, uh, couches, carpets, here talks about the jackets. I actually read a paper recently where they studied the air quality in sporting goods stores that had a lot of Gore-Tex jackets, and sure enough, there's pretty chemicals in the air. It's pretty astounding. Uh, food packaging, primarily popcorn bags, nonstick coatings. Um, you know, when Teflon came out, and it was all, you know, there's all these great advantageous properties of Teflon, but PFAS, and specifically PFOA, is a, is a precursor to Teflon production, so that's a pitfall there. And then really these aqueous film forming foams. I mean, these are the most efficient firefighters that exist. Uh, and there's 600 sites um, that have been classified as uh, fire crash training sites by the Defense Environmental Restoration Program which means that these are primarily Air Force bases and DOD-owned sites where they used AFFFs uh, on a regular basis for decades. 
Um, here's some, just a little brief overview of the health effects. Like I said, I'm, we're not really into this, but just to kind of show, these are a number of different health effects that, that one can have. Um, the uh, effects that uh, PFAS can have on pregnant women is fairly astounding, and the effects that that can have on, on birth defects, there's, uh, uh, there's actually a documentary on Netflix about that. Um, but really, the, the reason that they have this health advisory at 70 parts per trillion is because these bioaccumulate. I think there's still some ambiguity on where these bioaccumulate, whether it's in just the fat or the liver or what have you. Uh, but the reason that this is so low is because these bioaccumulate and just stick in your body for so long. Um, and this is, you know, they say the EPA health advisor, this is PFOA and PFOS, and they're working to lower this. Actually, in, in, in Michigan, um, the drinking water limits are now uh, 12 and 11 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS. Uh, for waters that are used as a drinking water source, uh, I believe it's 400 parts per trillion for PFOA. It's still 12 PPT for PFOS, but for water sources that are not used for drinking water, for PFOA, you can, I think it's actually up to two parts per billion, or no, sorry, it's 12 parts per billion of uh, the limit in waters that aren't used for drinking water in the state of Michigan. Um, and as I'll show, we're not going after drinking water analyses, so it kind of made things a little bit easier on us, but I'm not quite sure uh, that 12 PPV in the environment is still good. But it's worth considering that this, is, this action limit or advisory level is 215 times lower than the action limit for lead. Lead has a, a half-life in your body of 28 days, and then you essentially metabolize it and excrete it. Granted, it wreaks havoc on your body for those 28 days, but nonetheless, you do metabolize it, and that's where this discrepancy comes in is because PFAS bioaccumulates so readily. Um, this kind of shows just the widespread drinking water contamination. Um, you know, a lot here in the East and Midwest where we've had you know, chemical industry and things like that, especially out here in California. As you can see, they don't really have much industry here in the Western United States, so there's not really PFAS contamination, let's say. Uh, but nonetheless, this is, this is very uh, widespread, and it's probably, I mean, this is a couple of years old. I'm sure there's, there's quite a bit more now. Um, so where do they come from? I mean, this isn't just specifically to Michigan, but I just did, I did put just sites in Michigan. So with respect to vapor suppressants, so the automotive, automobile industry in Michigan is very robust. And the, uh, um, actually I'll elaborate on this in a second, but essentially it's the, pla it's the, when they're etching plastics to deposit chrome and things like that on the inside of your car, there is a you know, mixture of acids that I'll talk about that is particularly bad for you and there's vapor suppressants you need to put on top to blanket the vapors. Uh, waterproofing. Um, the Wolverine Shoe Company or Wolverine Worldwide Tannery in Grand Rapids use Scotchgard, 3M Scotchgard. Primary ingredient is PFOS to waterproof their boots for the longest time, dump their waste into a landfill in uh, Kent County. Um, and then firefighting foams. I already mentioned this 600 sizing, but we do have the Wordsmith Air Force Base up in uh, sort of northeastern Michigan where I'll show some plots of pretty widespread contamination around that site. And this is sort of used as a model site for PFAS contamination for a lot of people who are doing research around the country. So vapor suppressants. I mentioned how um, you have all these chrome-plated plastic in your car. So there's a lot of uh, surface finishing companies in Michigan that do work for the automobile industry or motorcycles, things like that. Uh, and they use a mixture of sulfuric and chromic acid in the etching process. And the vapors that come off of this bath of concentrated acids will melt your mucous membrane if you breathe it in, and you'll die shortly thereafter. Uh, so what they do is you need a vapor suppressant blanket on top of these baths of chromic and sulfuric acid so that you don't breathe the vapors in. And as such, uh, PFAS are remarkable uh, vapor suppressants. Um, we've met with a couple of companies that switched um, to non-PFAS-containing vapor suppressants, but really it's just also a perfluorinated chemical where there's maybe four, eight, or six hydrogens where four, eight, or six fluorines should be. And when you've got quite an oxidative environment right here, and so they're finding at, in their effluents that there's PFOS in there, well, it's okay, yeah, because this is a fairly oxidative environment. You might be breaking down something and then just kicking off the H and replacing it with fluorine, and then you're transforming it into PFOS in the end. So that's another challenge um, for, for these, for specifically the surface finishing and vapor suppressant industry, let's say. And then also, I'm in Mount Pleasant, uh, about an hour north of Lansing, 
Um, and this is a this is also an issue at some of these old refineries where they use vapor suppressants on top of uh, you know throughout the oil refining process to keep it from igniting. So there's some concerns up in uh, in, in Mount Pleasant as well. Um, so waterproofing. I already mentioned that Scotchgard uh, produced by 3M was used to waterproof boots at Wolverine. Um, they, like I said, have dumped their waste into the Rockford landfill. That's why Rockford, Michigan has fairly robust contamination. I'll show that in a few slides. Um, but nonetheless, it's contaminated the groundwater and subsequently the drinking water. So now, last January, they're getting sued. Wolverine's getting sued by uh, Michigan. And then you see here, five months later, oh, yeah, Wolverine wants 3M to pay for it. So, you know, it's this just cyclic thing. When actually, in 3M's defense, they did stop making PFOA and PFOS in the early 2000s. And they did, you know, they did provide a lot of information about their animal testing to certain companies that were using their products. And then that's kind of, uh, you know, it was sort of up to the companies, I suppose, at that point. Um, but nonetheless, you know, this is, a, this is real common seeing this stuff anymore. Uh, here's, this is, um, this is Rockford, Michigan. Uh, so as you can see, here's the landfill site. And this is just all of the contaminated uh, waterways. And I actually was giving this presentation. Um, I used this slide at, at a presentation at MSU. And one of the students that was giving, I can't remember, I think she lived like in this neighborhood or something like that. And they knew all about it. So it's kind of, you know, especially when you're in Michigan giving these talks, these things sort of hit home with some people. Because well, I mean, Grand Rapids is a great place to live. Um, it's a great city. But you know, this contamination is everywhere. Um, so, OK, the Wordsmith Air Force Base. I think I'll just kind of go through this one a little bit quicker and just go to this next one. So here's the Air Force Base. And like I said, this is um, sort of, if you look at Michigan as your hand is sort of like middle way up your index finger. Um, but here's Van Etten Lake, and here's the Wordsmith Air Force Base. And when they uh, built the Air Force Base, as far as I know, they thought that everything, if any, they contaminated anything, it would just get into Van Etten Lake, and they would dilute it, and it wouldn't go any further. But here you see these plumes have reached Lake Huron. So they didn't really look beyond Van Etten Lake for some of this PFAS stuff. And then when you start digging a bit, this is where they're finding these, these plumes. And these are all, these green dots are residential. These are wells. So as you can see, all these people around this base are contaminated with, with fairly significant levels. I mean, even this light color here, that's, what, 51 to 300 PPT. Up here, you get up into 1,000 to 5,000. So the people around here are, are very concerned. I have went and had a meeting with the superintendent of the city of Oscoda, or Oscoda Township. Um, and they're, they're working to implement activated carbon things. And actually, they have already implemented activated carbon. Um, but as I'll talk about in a little bit, there's some pitfalls that go on with that as well. Um, I also want to mention uh, the PFAS and landfills and landfill leachates, um, specifically because our, and I'll get to when we start talking about our technology, we have found two niches uh, that we think are most applicable, and one is in landfills and landfill leachates. So this was a paper that was published, I believe, in two, yeah, 2013 by a number of years. Morton Barlaz is a big guy in, in landfills at NC State. And then here's Jennifer Field, who's a, uh, an analytical um, faculty out at uh, Oregon State University. And she's done a lot of work in PFAS analyses. But nonetheless, they estimated 61.1 million meters cubed of uh, leachate that's been sent to a, um, a wastewater treatment plant. 79% is in landfills and wet climates. In Michigan, we're sort of like a wet slash dry climate, depending on the time of year. Uh, but nonetheless, they also estimated 560 to 640 kilograms of PFASs were sent to these wastewater treatment plants from leachates. And so, you know, and you got your traditional activated carbon and things like that has a lot of issues with the landfill leachate because you have a lot of other co-contaminants, a lot of uh, organic load and things like that. But for the same reason that activated carbon has some issues capturing short chain PFAS is the same reason that these landfill liners have a trouble capturing short chain PFAS. So in the leachates that we've looked at, we've seen a lot of short stuff, short chain carboxylates and sulfonates um, because these are a little bit easier to sneak through these landfill liners. Um, this is kind of shows, I saw this on a poster that you guys have as well. It's a great figure. This just kind of shows you where all of the uh, contamination can come from. Um, there's a few lakes in Michigan where we can't eat the fish. There's a few counties where you can't eat the deer, uh, all stemming from, uh, from PFAS contamination. And then this is something I pulled off the MDEQ that kind of shows us an additional 
uh, water cycle and how it can get out into the rivers and the groundwater and be transported to a variety of different locations. Um, yeah, so at the end of 2000-2002, you know, 3M phased out production um, of, of PFOA and PFOS. Uh, eight other major chemical manufacturers committed to doing this by 2015. However, we're still just talking about PFOA and PFOS. So what was the solution then? Okay, well, let's make Gen X. That's just C6. So that's been the workaround of the regulations is let's just get around this by shortening the chain and then continuing. So down in North Carolina, Chemers, which is a spinoff of uh, when Dow and DuPont merged, and sure enough, they continued to make uh, Gen X. And actually, DuPont manufactured their own PFOS and PFOA after 3M uh, stopped making it. So that's worth considering. But nonetheless, to elaborate on that, there are, this says 400 plus. You can read other people will say 1,000 plus. I mean, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of precursor compounds. And as it says here, there is a specific lack of understanding on the transformation pathways of these. So a huge issue with for us, since we're doing, we do destruction and we do defluorination, is trying to close this fluorine mass balance. And so several times you can see where in literature, and we've had this happen to us too, where we get more fluorine back than we thought was in there. And that's because we, the analytical methods we use, they can't measure. I mean, there's still you know, carbon fluorine, and here's N, so this could be four, six, eight, whatever, but you have these amine groups here, and these can be transformed, depending on the environment, into a more recalcitrant perfluoroalkyl acid. So that's why you'll see some people will they'll measure something in the influent of a plant, and then the effluent will be higher, and they don't understand why. Well, it's, you know, you didn't look at all these. And throughout your processes when you're treating water, you're most likely transforming them into a more recalcitrant uh, PFAA. So this is something that we're um, attempting to tackle and look into to try and really close the fluorine mass balance. But this is one of the major hurdles in this issue in general is really understanding how much fluorine you've got in a, in a given sample. Um, this is, I just kind of want to say like here, thousands of perfluorinated precursors. So they call this the dark matter. So here's all the stuff we know about and then this big vortex of precursors that we don't really know anything about. Um, so to talk a little bit about remediation technologies, I'm going to focus uh, quite a bit on activated carbon and ion exchange, and then talk about some locations where they're implemented and some promising results that have been reported. Uh, some other technologies and uh, UV methods, whether that's oxida oxidative or reductive, um, I, I'm not really going to talk about thermal treatment or reverse osmosis because um, I kind of wanted to spend a lot more time on the, on the EO. Um, I think with respect to time, I'll probably go this, go this a little quickly. But nonetheless, this is an activated carbon matrix. So activated carbon relies on chemical adsorption um, to remediate PFAS, let's say. But then this has the sort of mesopores up here that kind of sneak down into these micropores. And because this relies solely on essentially the hydrophobicity of the PFAS, you could, that's why you can have some difficulties with short chains because the shorter chains are less hydrophobic than the long chain. So, and typically the long chains are higher in concentration. So if you have a short chain that's absorbed, the likelihood of a longer chain coming and kicking it off and it's sneaking through this micropore is quite high. So that's why you'll see breakthrough curves, which I'll show of uh, a shorter chain PFAS on activated carbon are relatively poor Long chain is okay, but that's one of those reasons that you can have some issues with the shorter chains, like the four, five chain uh, carboxylates and sulfonates. Um, ion exchange gives you an added uh, advantage. And remember I said this hydrophobic head, hydrophobic tail. So the activated carbon is really folk, uh, geared towards that hydrophobic head. But with ion exchange, the, you can synthesize or fabricate resins that have dual site, so you can have the, the cross-linker that can absorb the, uh, the hydrophobic portion, but then you can also have a cation exchange or an anion exchange resin that can electrostatically attract that acid group. So you sort of double your capacity, and then you kind of uh, intrinsically eliminate this issue of you know, one chain length being more hydrophobic than the other because you can get it by electrostatic attraction. So that's some of the advantages of using ion exchange and that you have this dual capability. Um, a Brita filter is actually a combination of both uh, ion exchange resin and activated carbon. However, 
this ion exchange resin is not, uh, it doesn't have this dual efficacy. You can, there's a lot of different types of resins, but unfortunately a Brita filter will not get the PFAS out for you. But I just wanted to know this is a combination of activated carbon and ion exchange resin. Um, to elaborate on IX a little more, uh, emerging contaminant treatment technologies, they're located in Maine, and they've designed this Sor Sorbix Pure IX resin. And this is the best adsorptive technology that I have seen to date. Uh, it has this dual site, whatever, I'm not sure exactly what they use. Obviously, it's proprietary. But they have, um, let's put it this way. The country of Australia flies massive, I can't remember the type of plane, it's huge cargo planes to Maine to pick up shipping containers of this resin and they fly it back to Australia and then they implement it in Melbourne. They're treating several million gallons per day with this stuff. Trouble is, the resin's made in China uh, now, so it's gotten more expensive because uh, you have to pay an import tax and so there's some interest in being able to regenerate the resin and not just take it out and burn it. Um, so that's where we sort of come in and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, here's some of this is a, a system where they did a pilot scale test uh, at a, um, uh, I believe this says in Australia, they also did this. I think the data I'm going to show is actually from a, a Air Force base in New England area. Um, but nonetheless, they stood up activated carbon and ion exchange against one another. And so here's a breakthrough curve. Um, so you have bed volumes, which is essentially the absorptive capacity, let's say. And then here at the top, this is the uh, influence. So they had about 10 ppb. Here's PFOA. So the blue and the yellow are this, this has two and a half and five empty bed contact time. That's essentially how long the the water was in contact with the activated carbon or the resin. Um, but as you can see, the uh, five minute empty bed contact time on the resin, you get almost over, over 10,000 bed volumes. You look at activated carbon, that's you know practically 2,000. So you've increased this by a factor of five before you get breakthrough. Uh, with PFOA, PFOS looks even better. So here's activated carbon breaking through in about two, one to 2,000 bed volumes again. Here's at two and a half minutes empty bed contact time with their resin. Again, got about 10,000 of it, and then they didn't even get breakthrough of PFOS with this resin. Uh, now, I didn't show, I think, I, I don't think I put the shorter chain compounds in there. This resin does have a little bit of an issue with PFBA, so the perfluorobutanoic uh, acid, so the four chain carboxylate. So that's one Achilles heel of this is that the four chain. Uh, carboxylate is a little bit of a, um, an issue for them. I'm not, I'm not an ion exchange uh, expert, so I'm not exactly sure why that is, but it is something that they showed in, in this paper here. Um, so, like I said, what happens when saturation occurs? Uh, if for, for GAC, you take it out and you burn it and you incinerate it. And typically, that's done at 800, 850 degrees C for normal saturated activated carbon. But for PFAS contaminated GAC, you've got to jack that up a few uh, hundred degrees C extra. Now, there is, again, a little bit of ambiguity on the pollution of PFAS in the air. That I saw a study, I think it was in the Netherlands, where they studied the gases coming out of an incinerator, and they still found PFOA and PFOS in there. I've read papers where they were finding PFAS in the blood of polar bears at the North Pole, so they think that there's some transport in the air from these incinerating processes, so it's not quite as advantageous, let's say. Um, but with IX, you can regenerate it uh, by adding a solvent brine mixture. So essentially you add, this is you know commonly, let's say methanol and sodium chloride, uh, where the methanol will desorb everything that was um, chemically absorbed to the resin. The sodium chloride kicks out uh, all of the electrostatically attracted um, PFAS you might have in there. And then, so just an example, Let's say you have 100,000 gallons of water, you treat it with your resin, your resin saturated, you run your uh, solvent brine mixture through, and then you come out with, let's say, 500 gallons of, of this solvent brine concentrated PFAS mixture. Common practice is to distill the solvent back off so you can reuse it, and you're left with a couple hundred gallons of very concentrated, very salty PFAS waste, which is called a still bottom. And that's, again, where our technology comes in. I'll talk about that in a second. Here's actually another paper published where they, they actually took these uh, regenerate concentrates and they used, um, they degraded PFOA and PFOS over time. As you can see, this is in milligrams per liter. So this is a million times more concentrated than the PPT levels that we're talking about for drinking water. So 
Um, I think I'm going to skip this just because for the sake of time. Um, I think I'll go through this relatively quickly as well and just highlight the fact that this is extremely difficult to analyze and this is sort of a bottleneck for a lot of people and that you can either do EPA method 537, you can do ASTM D7979, all of which need a triple quad mass spec. Sometimes they need time of flight mass spectrometer, a lot of expensive instrumentation, but it's the only instrument that, in, instrumentation that can get down this low. So you don't really have a choice, at least for current technology. And this sample analysis can be, we've gotten 250, 400 to do uh, a total organic fluorine. We've, it's, it's even more than this. So this is a, a big bottleneck for a lot of people, but I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty, let's say. Um, another thing we can do is since we do defluorination, we can use fluoride ion selective electrodes uh, at higher concentrations as a way to indirectly monitor our uh, PFAS degradation. So we did this for a few of the figures that I'm gonna show, because you know it's $900 for one ISE probe that we can use for a few months before you have to buy a new one, but that's still a little bit more cost effective. The downside is that we don't get this extra layer of information about um, you know maybe the mechanism and, and what sort of PFAS we might be making in solution based on our degradation processes. Um, I'll just highlight this. EPA method 537 gets you about 14 to 17. The modified will get you 20 to 25. And then the ASTM method can get you 35 to 40. The trouble is a lot of the ASTM methods, they use direct injection. So they don't really do a bona fide extraction procedure before they send uh, the solution through the, um, to the mass spec. As I'll show, our processes require a degree of conductivity. And we are making ions as we treat so Direct injection is sort of a nightmare uh, with our samples. Okay, so now we can get into the, the good stuff here. Oh, that kind of got smashed up. So we're using electrochemical oxidation. Um, so what this shows here in the top right, uh, and I also have electrochemical advanced oxidation, which is the generation of hydroxyl radicals or some sort of uh, um, oxidizing agent that we can generate at the electrode surface. I'll talk about the ambiguity of the of of uh, what, what, how the processes go for PFAS, but nonetheless, we have an anode and cathode or a series of anodes and cathodes in solution, and we're applying a high voltage or high current through the surface. In our space, a high voltage, high current is maybe 5, 10, 15 amps, 5, 10, 15, or 5, 10, 15 volts, and then maybe, depending on the size of the electrodes, um, you know, maybe 5 to 10 amps. We're talking like anywhere from 10 to 100, 150 milliamps per centimeter squared is where we're actually operating. Um, but nonetheless, I, I just have organics here, but an organic, this is real common for just traditional wastewater treatment, an organic will interact with the electrode surface, whether that's direct through direct electron transfer at the electrode surface, or we can generate hydroxyl radicals at the anode surface, and that can go scavenge an organic uh, contaminant, and then effectively oxidize it or mineralize it into its components, which is CO2 and water. In the case of PFAS, we got CO2, water, and fluoride ions. Um, but nonetheless, that's an advantage of this technology is that it is destructive. You can do mineralization. However, if you look here at the cathode reaction, it's kind of hard to see, but we are making hydrogen gas. So we generate about 0.4 liters of hydrogen per amp hour. So this is a, one thing to consider is that we do generate significant hydrogen, especially when we're using diamond cathodes. Diamond is a very, this reaction occurs very, very readily on, on diamond. Um, but again, I sort of talked about hydroxyl radicals a little bit, but we don't always, there's some ambiguity in the literature as whether you need hydroxyl radicals or not. But nonetheless, the hydroxyl radical is the most powerful oxidant that one can generate compared to even ozone, bleach, hydrogen peroxide, things like that. But again, there's not always that we have to use hydroxyl radicals, but nonetheless, it's crucial that anything we're trying to oxidize gets very, very close to the electrode surface. And I'm talking nanometer, maybe sub-nanometer distances from the electrode surface. Because even if we're generating a hydroxyl radical, these are so reactive that the lifetime is a few nanoseconds. So you've got to get these to the electrode surface in order to actually have something occur. Um, and I'll talk about that. Um, I think I'll go through this. Uh, I'll just breeze through this. But essentially, for traditional wastewater treatment, if you know the molecule that you're after, you can actually do a series of calculations to determine the COD that you have, chemical oxygen demand that you have, and you can actually do a number of calculations where you say, okay, I want to go from this COD level to this COD level, and we can actually calculate 
the theoretical charge that we need, and then we can actually calculate the actual area that we might need. I'm not going to go through this for the sake of time, but nonetheless, for traditional wastewater treatment practices, when you know the contaminant that you have, and it's not PFAS, you can actually do these calculations for PFAS, unfortunately. Of course, we can't use it, but just in, just in general, it's a nice little tool to have. Um, this kind of elaborates on this need to get things very close to the electrode surface. So this is a model that was uh, developed by, um, I forget his first name, his last name's Comey Nellis, but he's done a lot of theoretical work in wastewater treatment and electrochemical oxidation. But here you have COD, so this is basically the amount of oxidative, ox, well, the amount of oxidation that we need in order to reduce uh, what sort of contaminant we have in solution. Then here's current density on the Y. And so you have this mass transport and current limited region Unfortunately for PFAS, because the concentrations are so low, see this is in grams per liter, so we are what, one billion times lower than this. So we're almost always in the mass transport limited region. So we've had to do some innovative things with our reactor design to ensure that we're getting down to these low levels. And this is also why we're going after two specific niche applications that I'll talk about. Um, there's some ambiguity in the literature as to whether you need hydroxyl radicals or not. Here's one specifically that shows that it's a direct electron transfer process to get it started, and then you need the hydroxyl radical to do, to get an intermediate, and that's how you cause defluorination. Like I said, we've done these experiments with uh, hydroxyl radical scavengers, and we still get good degradation, but then there's other folks that report things contradictory to that. And so and there's other people that contradict one another. So let's say that we've, it's a little bit difficult in this area to go off of literature. And again, I really personally think that it stems from the variability and the analytical that one group might use to the next. So I think that's really the big issue. Um, but we're using boron doped diamond. So the reason that boron doped diamond is so advantageous is that it has the highest oxygen over potential of any electrode material that one can use. It's a wide band gap P-type semiconductor, so it's a great anode material. Here, this is just a, a voltage current plot here, so you can see platinum, gold, glassy carbon, and diamond. Each time this current increases here, that's the oxygen over potential, where you'll begin to do this reaction right here. And as you can see, that does not occur on diamond till beyond about two volts. Now, if we were to scan even further, you would see that this really jumps up, and actually it's called what's called the taffel slope of this uh, oxygen over potential. And you can, that can give you some interesting uh, information about the efficiency of hydroxyl radical production, should we need that. Um, but nonetheless, we have a lot of control over the growth process. So these are boron doped diamond films. So each one of these in this microcrystalline film, these are individual uh, diamond grains that you can see here. This is a very dense coating, it's about five to 10 micrometers thick on, uh, on primarily metal niobium substrates for this application. But we can also make nanocrystalline diamonds. So this scale bar here, this is one micron, this is five microns. You can't even see the crystallites here. But the reason we don't use nanocrystalline diamond for this is that each time a diamond crystal grain meets another diamond crystal grain, that's where sp2 hybridized carbon hides. And we want sp3 hybridized carbon because sp2 hybridized carbon is glassy carbon. We need the advantages of diamond. So if we have nanocrystalline diamond, we have a significant amount more crystallites, therefore more grain boundaries, more sp2. So when we go push in this voltage current up, we just etch the sp2 to carbon dioxide for the same reasons that we uh, can oxidize an organic contaminant. So we try and um, I won't really go into the doping procedure and all that, but we really use, we gear our processes towards high SP3 content. Um, oh, this one takes a second. I think I'll go through this relatively quickly um, as well, but essentially if we take methane gas, hydrogen gas, and diborane under specific reactor conditions, the, here's a microwave CVD reactor, we essentially add microwave power and we create a, a, ion, or a, a plasma where we ionize these process gases, and then we will get uh, diamond growth. So this is one way via microwave-assisted CVD. Uh, this, the growth rates are quicker and, and faster in microwave CVD. However, the substrates can only be up to six inches in diameter. So this is, very, this is excellent for some of our microfabricated sensors and things like that. We use microwave-assisted CVD. Uh, but for this, for PFAS and coating these electrodes, we use hot filament CVD which is essentially like a gigantic toaster, which I'll show right here. So we have these tungsten filaments that are heated to a well above 2400 degrees Celsius, 
and that's what ionizes the process gases, and then you get diamond growth down here. In this system, we could do four or six inch wafers at once if we wanted to, but in this case, we do plates and things like that. So that's why this is a little bit more advantageous, even though the growth, growth rates are a little bit slower. Uh, here is our laboratory scale system that we use at the current moment. Um, we, we collaborate very closely with our uh, Fraunhofer spinoff in Germany, Kondias. They're uh, a very close colleague um, of a number of my colleagues. But essentially, we have these two reactors. We have a parallel plate reactor, and we have this flow-through reactor. And I can show the, the pieces of the flow-through reactor. But this is really for high concentrations. So when I say high concentrations, we're talking like hundreds of milligrams per liter. So this is probably true for traditional wastewater treatment. We don't really use this for any of the PFAS because that mass transport is not great in uh, a parallel plate reactor. This is when we're in the current limited region where we have so much uh, things, so many things to oxidize and not enough current to supply, we'll go with the parallel plate reactor because we have more area. For something where we're always in the mass transport limited region, we use this flow through reactor so we increase the likelihood of getting something to the electrode surface. Um, this is a colleague of mine as well at uh, CDM Smith, Charles Schaefer. He's done, he's had some sort of projects. He's done a number of work uh, in PFAS remediation using our electrodes. Um, I will say he's probably got even more experience using our electrodes for this than we do because he's been doing it for quite some years, uh, but he's also investigating these transformation pathways. And so we're proposing some things where we might be able to use electrochemical oxidation to transform the precursors into the more recalcitrant compounds and then ramp up the current density and remediate them at the end so to kind of get, to, get two birds with one stone. Um, but here's some of our data. Um, so I have PFOA on this slide, PFOS on the next slide. Uh, so like I said, before I get into this, we are after two applications. We are not treating groundwater plumes, we're not treating drinking water, and we're not an end of pipe treatment method at a wastewater treatment plant. If you look at this graph, here's 50 milliamps per centimeter squared. In an hour, we've taken it from six ppm down below one ppm. So if we run these tests for just about another half hour, 45 minutes, we can effectively get all of this out. However, if you look at 50, this says watts per liter, because this is just a one hour test for these calculations, 88 watts out watts per liter. If you extrapolate that up to 41 million gallons, we're talking about 13, I think it's 13.74 gigawatts that would need per day to power a reactor to clean 41 million gallons of water. That's not gonna happen. So we immediately wrote all that off that it's not something where we're gonna be able to fit. So we thought, okay, where is this technology the best for? It's in high solution complexity, low solution volume. So that's where we get into reject solutions for our reverse osmosis, those regenerate solutions that I spoke about for ion exchange, because these technologies can handle millions and millions and millions of gallons. And if you were able to regenerate them more often and destroy it with electrochemical oxidation, it becomes a little bit more viable on a large scale. Um, or in landfill leachates. Like we're working with the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, they treat anywhere from 50 to 250,000 gallons per day. We think 50, maybe 100, a little bit above that, uh, thousand gallons per day is an attainable thing as a primary treatment option. But we still have to vet the technology because we've got a lot of other organic load, ammonia, as I'll show we can, that'll be not necessarily interference, it'll just eat up uh, sites for oxidation of PFAS. But so what we were trying to do, we, since we can't use this experimental model like I showed, we had to somehow do this experimentally. So we, when we did these tests of very current density, we found in the first 15 minutes there was an advantage of using a higher current density like 50 milliamps per centimeter squared. But then we looked at the slopes of all the lines or the rate constants of the lines thereafter and they were all similar. So we thought, okay, well why don't we just use the high current density for the first 15 minutes and then reduce the current density thereafter and see what we get. And sure enough, if we run this 50 milliamps per centimeter squared for 15 minutes, reduce it to five for the remainder of the time, we have about twice as much PFOA left after one hour. If we run it for a half hour longer, we get below this, and we're saving about 5x on the energy. So even though we're still not, this still is too much to do as an end of pipe treatment, we still want to design a way where we can save as much energy as possible. PFOS, we did the same thing, but we found that uh, 10 milliamps per centimeter squared was actually just as efficient as 50, so we didn't really go through this whole rigmarole of uh, mixed current densities, combined current densities. So really what we've moved forward with now is we either apply 10 milliamps per centimeter squared for our treatment or we do our combined 50 and five. Here is a, a comparison of measurements done with a fluoride ISE 
and then done by LCMS. Uh, Michigan State doesn't have a lot of robust capabilities in PFAS analysis, so we can only measure PFOA. So that's why we could only do PFOA for this one. Um, but here, this is 1, 5, 10, 25, 50, and 50 and 5. And so we thought that even though our LCMS measurement is only going to give us the PFOA, we thought, well, if we reference that against our fluoride measurements, we know that we're purposely gen probably generating short chains. Because if we don't get all the fluoride back, we know we still have complex fluoride, but the LCMS will tell us actually where the PFOA is at. And so as you can see, once we get down into 25, 50, we're, we, there's no PFOA remaining. But as you can see by the ISE, there is some PFOA remaining. So that's where we thought for the first time, okay, we're probably generating some short chains. And then at the same time, we also verified this with our 50 and five. And again, if we run this for another half hour, we get down to where we need to with 50. Um, but nonetheless, we went a little bit further and we did the EPA 537 method. Um, and that's what this data shows here. We started with two PPM of PFOA. This was uh, more of a regenerate style solution. So there was a little bit more concentrated. And within four hours, we've taken it from two PPM down to two PPB. Again, this is water that would not be used as a drinking water source. The limit in Michigan is 12 PPB. So this is good enough for use for that specific application or niche at the, in the state of Michigan. As you can see down here at the bottom, here is seven, six, and five of the carboxylates. So in a half hour, we generated about 15 to 20 PPB of those. Uh, and then again, by four hours, those were uh, completely gone. This was a good result in that we were able to remediate the short chains as well, but the detection limits for this method were about eight PPT. So that's where we thought in our flow through system, maybe we do have efficient enough mass transport because we would have seen these if they were still there. So that was one sort of promising thing. And we've done a lot of other experiments. We've, we've worked with leachates. Unfortunately, I thought I would have the, the sample analysis back before I came, uh, it was my hope but uh, I still haven't gotten the results back yet, but we've done a lot of our mixed current densities and things like that in, in landfill leachates doing 24 hour experiments. And this shows that the color is changing. It doesn't really do much for you with respect to PFAS, but I should have an update for that relatively soon. So I apologize about that. But these are two separate experiments and this data is actually detached from one another. This was a wastewater sample. This was a, these are the leachate samples. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'll go through this a little bit quickly as well. Um, Nonetheless, MSU is one of the only universities that doesn't send their food waste to a landfill or animal waste to, uh, well, I mean, they basically put the animal waste in here. And this is a massive anaerobic digester that they have. And they have a, uh, a, um, a solar powered unit across the street where they have their anaerobic digester. They have an electrocoagulation system to remove some solids. And then they have an RO. And through this process, they were able to remove everything except the ammonia. And so that's when they came knocking on our door to see if we could remove the ammonia. And so we did this in poultry plot processing water. And so as you can see here, here is as a function of current density in these poultry processing waters. Here we start out with total ammonia nitrogen, total nitrogen. So as you can see, they are almost all of the nitrogen in there is ammonia. Um, and then they said, this is a function of current density. And so as you can see, once we get up to 50 and 75, that's where we really can remove 100% of the ammonia. But as you can see, we've converted about 20% of it to nitrate. I don't have, we, we, we did nitrite and nitrite measurements, and it was exclusively this remaining TN was all nitrate, which is okay for this process and what they were doing because they were using for irrigation uh, water, so that was okay. Here's show some model reactions. Um, but nonetheless, like I said, this is not, as I'll talk about in a second, Electrochemical oxidation is not selective, which is sort of a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing that in a leachate, we could get rid of the ammonia and the PFAS, but it's also a curse in that we make some toxic byproducts that I'll talk about. Um, one last thing is we're also, this is sort of newer data, but we're also working on 1,4-dioxane, which is another emerging contaminant. Uh, we've done current density studies, as you can see. Um, it really, even at 10, within I think a little less than four hours, we've completely remedi remediated the 1,4 dioxane. We're also sticking at high levels as well because ion exchange is very efficient at removing 1,4 dioxane. We can regenerate it in the same manner that you do for PFAS. So we're looking at 1,4 dioxane as well. Um, and the reason that is, here's the city of Ann Arbor. There is a massive 1,4 dioxane plume in Washtenaw County in Michigan. So this is also a significant concern in the state. And again, we're working with, we've interfaced with Senator Peters' team 
about 1,4-diopsane and primarily about PFAS, but this is another thing uh, that's on our radar. Um, okay, so limitations and concerns. So this blessing and a curse thing. So when we have chloride in solution, depending on the current density, usually people say you need hydroxyl radicals to do this, but we make perchlorate. So that's one, and, that, and that's actually a, a specific Achilles heel of diamond in this method. Um, other materials like uh, mixed metal oxides are, and specifically magnelliphase titanium oxide is probably the biggest competitor to boron dope diamond. You do not generate perchlorate with TI-407. However, TI-407 has some issues treating shorter chain compounds. So every single one of these technologies has its own little Achilles heel advantage to things, things like that. So this is gonna be a big, a big puzzle. Um, and I already talked about the energy consumption. And then, like I said, we, for ammonia, we do convert it to nitrate, which could be a problem for a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so in conclusion, I'll see, I, I, yeah, okay. In conclusion, um, no treatment option is going to be the sole treatment option for PFAS. This is going to be a puzzle uh, of multiple treatment technologies that are going to be used to solve this issue. Uh, I talked about EO. We're going for low volume, high concentration or complex matrices. Still have a lot of research to do in health concerns, toxicity, fate and transport, et cetera. Um, Senator Gary Peters is really leading the push at the federal level. Uh, and I said, Michigan, actually this is our coming with this. Recently they changed this. Um, and like I said, the Brita won't quite do the trick to get it out of your water at home, but there is now NSF certified technology. I'm forgetting the name of the company. It's about 200 to $250 on Amazon and that is certified by NSF to remove PFOA and PFOS. Um, so on the lighter side of things, uh, we've been in the news a little bit. Whether that's good or a bad thing, uh, I gave a talk at the uh, MSU Bioeconomy Institute. So here's us, the Grand Haven Tribune. Uh, Bill Hoizenga endorsed us in one of his speeches. We didn't even know. I thought it was interesting. He's a congressman in uh, Michigan. This is MSU's article. And then we have some of the bad ones. These were all good. But then this is a guy in NPR who I remember I said diamond crystal grains because we all, when I was talking about this, he reported diamond crystal brains. So that was not ideal. So we stopped with him, and then here's these folks. Uh, I interviewed with this guy. I said exactly what I said to you guys. We're after these two niche applications. We're going after wastewater, complex samples, and then they run a story that night on NBC, Grand Rapids, toxic tap water. And then it says, MSU's PFAS pulverizer is cleaning water. And this guy had the perfect, perfect, like, news anchor kind of like narrator voice so him just like talking about the PFAS pulverizer it's just it's classic you can look it up and watch it it's 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 not funny because it, he misreported what we said but it's also it's ridiculous in all reality but nonetheless uh just at the end of last month in chemical and engineering news uh this woman Carrie Jansen did an article called forever chemicals no more this is the best PFAS related article that I have read from a scientific merit point of view that a reporter asked person did, and she did four different destructive technologies. We were interviewed for the electrochemical part, and there's some other, like there's some plasma treatments and things going on at Clarkson University in New York. There's other people working on destructive technologies. We're not the only ones using electrochemical oxidation. We're not the only ones that make diamond electrodes. We just happen to be good at it, and we're applying it uh, to this. So I wanna make it, we're not really, we're not reinventing the wheel here, but at the same time, this isn't something that we just cooked up in our lab and invented. There's other people working on this. Um, so with that, I'll acknowledge uh, my colleagues. This is my graduate student, Mary. This is all this work has been done by her. This is Vanessa. She's a new graduate student uh, finishing her first year. That's sort of getting into this as well. Um, some of my other colleagues and students and then uh, uh, an environmental consulting firm we've worked on that's helped provide us with, with real samples to work with. Um, and then the folks at MSU's communications and brand strategy, um, because without them, we wouldn't have really gotten the word out. And since then, we've gotten uh, a contract from the city of Grand Rapids to look into uh, electrochemical oxidation and landfill leachates. And they saw this article and approached us. So uh, while I was very apprehensive about doing this uh, news article, it's, it's more or less. So with that being said, thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry, I have a tendency to talk longer than the allotted time that I'm given, and I think I did it again, but I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thanks for a great presentation. Yeah. Um, before we take questions in the room, I'll just remind our online audience that you could type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and um, I will read those to our speaker. So, mm -hmm. okay. questions from our audience? Yeah. Um, actually, I have two questions okay. for you. So, so first thing is the: uh, Have you tried to calculate the Faraday efficiency by excluding the uh, water oxidation ratio? By excluding the water oxidation reaction? Yes, because hmm. the, uh, under the high potential or the high core density, yeah, and yeah. you can avoid the water oxidation yeah. reaction, right? We so did. So then yeah. it's the, all the, uh, the yeah. current density is the, it's the mixture yeah. of the uh, yeah. water oxidation plus the uh, PFS mm -hmm. oxidation mm -hmm. current, right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, that's you, a good point. I can't say that that's something that, that we've done. We did try and cal we did a number of experiments to try and calculate the Faraday efficiency, mm -hmm. and we did not have much success. Um, but no, I don't think we, we didn't probably differentiate between the, the water oxidation reaction. Perhaps that's something that we should look into, yeah. Okay. Um, and the second question is the, uh, um, I'm a bit worried about the, uh, like, electrolyte oxidation status under the high potential. Okay. Like, uh, for example, like, uh, you're, if you're using the sodium sulfate or the sodium perchlorate as mm -hmm. electrolyte yeah. material, mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, under the high potential, mm -hmm. is there any chance to the sulfate ion is uh, decomposed um, or well, oxidized? Under yeah. So I mean, that's um, to do what's called the total oxidizable uh, precursor assay, um, which is how you can get. So if you combine the mass spec measurement with total organic fluorine and then the total oxidizable precursor assay, that's the way to close this fluorine mass balance and really get the full idea. Trouble is, top assay is 700 bucks, TOF is 700 bucks, and then you got the, the analyses. But what they do in the total oxidizable precursor assay is they rely on that breakdown of sulfate to make peroxy disulfuric acid or persulfate, and that can Based help on the, the, uh, the standard uh, what, um, reduction potential. Yeah, right, and so we believe that in sodium sulfate we're making per sulfate as well. We haven't really had any issues with, let's say, breaking down the um, uh, electrolyte, let's say. We thought, that's why with some of these companies that we're working with doing the regenerate solutions, they all want to use sodium chloride because it's the best, you know, it's the most efficient. But we're sitting there thinking like, well, how about sodium hydroxide or sodium sulfate? So we've had some success. I didn't say like either we're, this was internally funded for, 16 months, and we spent a lot of time on the interface of niobium and diamond. Because you have to pre-treat the niobium substrate very, very intricately, or else you won't get good adhesion. So we have to etch the substrates in a very specific way that we don't get oxide formation, on, or else it's, that's, where, that's where we get delamination. So a lot of our time was spent optimizing the coating. So I wouldn't say that we we're still learning a lot ourselves. Like we don't have all of the questions answered by any stretch of the imagination. So like I said, this is stuff that we're still learning as well because we really focused a lot on developing the reactor and the coding and stuff like that. And we can always talk some more as well, yeah. Do you have any idea what the cost would be on like a per gallon basis? A per gallon basis. Um, the issue with that is that uh, we don't know yet what current density we need to use. So it's really difficult to say. Um, I can say that that system that, we, that I showed there is about $60,000 from just off the shelf, let's say. And a little under half of that is all tied up in the electrodes. So you're talking for that big parallel plate reactor and this other reactor were on the order of 10 to 15,000 in just electrodes. So what we've designed, uh, not designed, we've sort of spec'd out a pilot scale system where the electrode area will be eh, maybe 10 times larger. And that's, again, the larger we get, the more expensive they get because in diamond, unfortunately, the more space you take up in the reactor, it's the more expensive it gets. So actually, as we make larger substrates, it's actually more expensive on a per unit basis. Um, so the, that, the pilot scale system we figure is about 160K, and that can do 10,000 liters. But again, over half of that's tied up in the electrodes. And that doesn't count the energy costs as well. So like I said, this isn't cheap. Like, this is not cheap. Absolutely, it's not cheap. But I don't have a bona fide number for you just because we don't know what currents that we actually are going to. And that, 
Because at, at 50 milliamps or 100 milliamps per centimeter squared, the lifetime of the electrodes is a heck of a lot different than at 10. So like, then you start bringing that into the equation. Okay, well, can I get, if I'm at 10, can I have a five-year investment on my electrodes versus two years? So this is all so many moving parts, like I said, that we're still learning a lot ourselves. Um, so you mentioned your process kind of mass transfer limited. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it possible like to fabricate a slurry instead of like a flow through or, um, or a flow by electrode, just yeah. like to have a slurry of like flow electrodes? Like that's what's done, mm. like for example, in capacitive DNA Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This limitation. I, uh, hmm. Let's see here. The trouble is, is that we're sort of limited in the substrate geometries that okay. we can coat. Um, that's, an, that's another sort of disadvantage of diamond is that we can only grow on a certain number of substrates because they have to have a very low thermal expansion coefficient. And so we have to, even machining these flow through electrodes is a little bit of a challenge. I suppose that would be possible though. That would be interesting. I guess I don't know as much about things like that. So I mean, it's and something you can get like to the nanoscale level yeah. and create like small spheres. Yeah. Like it's kind of yeah, and no, we you know? yeah, we, we get a lot of people who ask us about diamond powder um, to increase surface area to sort of mitigate this. And uh, in full disclosure, where we've grown freestanding diamond films and then we've detonated them or we've given them to people to detonate. Uh, because that's uh, nano diamonds in general that aren't doped are used for a lot of drug delivery processes. And usually people just take undoped diamond and they just detonate it and they make nano diamonds. You have a little bit of a difficulty in, I think you get like 10 to 60 micron crystallite sizes. But that is something that we're, we're trying. We have a prototype uh, reactor fixture uh, for that hot filament system that will, it sort of comes out like this and it'll rotate and we could put diamond powder in it and coat it with boron, don't diamond over top, but it's uh, the hot filament CVD, those those filaments I said are 2400 degrees C, so trying to find the right materials that we've, like, we've given it a shot a couple times and it's uh, it's a challenge, but nobody can provide that, so that's why we're sort of looking towards uh, this boron dope diamond powder, so we get asked a lot for powder for that exact application. And, you know, we get into these sort of issues sometimes where somebody comes and wants something like that, but, and they want, and they're gonna go write a proposal or something to try and get funded, but it's like, well, actually, we wanna write the proposal and get funded. So sometimes we have to turn people away because they wanna do things that we wanna do. But that's why we're really open to collaboration. I've said it to a number of, of you guys here is that um, we don't really like to be a provider of material, although we can, like, then that's, sometimes that's all people want and that's fine. But most of the time, we like to develop it in some sort of way that it can be a collaborative effort uh, where, because like we've got some flexibility. We can change doping. You can look at different crystallite sizes. You can do different film thicknesses, so all these different things. So you know, not everybody wants that flexibility, but that's sort of where we try and gear these things is toward the collaborative effort where we can do some development and some knowledge sharing and things like that. So that's kind of how we rig, rig these projects up, I'd say, yeah. Do we have one last question from the room? Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, do you know what is the cost of water treatment with the sorbix ion exchange resin? Uh, so I do know a ballpark that that resin is between 400 and $425 per cubic foot. That's the only number I can probably give it. That is, and I don't think it was cheaper, but then they, I think they outsourced it to China or so, and now they have to pay the import tax to get it back. And uh, are you, um, thinking along the lines of uh, using like hybrid technology like on the front end or highly concentrated you yeah. can use the electrolytic oxidation mm -hmm. yeah and on the back end instead of taking the current too high mm -hmm. you can once you treat it to a certain level mm -hmm. then you can use the ion exchange. yeah so that yeah that's that's another thing and, and especially working with the city of grand rapids we're trying to if with the leachates we're trying to say okay does the eo need to be in front like as it comes off of the tank and then we can have something behind it that could remove any residual PFAS or uh, any byproducts that we make. So that's, that's again, so this goes back to that sort of puzzle thing. So we've actually thought of, you know, an adsorbent, then the EO, and then another adsorbent. So that's sort of where we're at at the current moment. Because like the common, even with ion exchange, the, after they regenerate it, they make that still bottom, they'll throw it in a super adsorbent, 
and then just toss it back in the landfill or incinerate it. Um, but that's where like, I, you know, we could use that super absorbent still after our treatment process, because then we might be able to rig it to remove the perchlorate, things like that. So that's, you know, that get back to, gets back to this sort of puzzle thing. And that's, you know, but certainly, yeah, like I said, we're on, like I said, we're open to collaborate. We're looking for partners still and a lot of this stuff. So we're very open to, to collaborating and things like that, so. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. If if you guys think of a question later on, I think it's okay to contact you. One hundred percent. Yeah, and like I said, I well, you know, the invitation is open for you guys to come check out our facility uh, up in, in East Lansing and MSU and get a tour and see all the capabilities that uh, that we have. I, I told a few people here that it's you know, but we always find it best when you know. Obviously, we know what we do. We know the applications we're after, and we think we can provide you with something. But you might come there and see that, you know, we've got all these other capabilities and you think, okay, well, that really work for me. And like I said, there's eight different groups that are doing different things and you might find something with another group. So I think it's, yeah, you're more than welcome. Feel free to reach out anytime. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.